The emerging coalescence of biotechnology, nanotechnology, and information technology holds out prospects for economic and social benefits that should make those of the past 50 years look pale by comparison. Now, I'm not talking about breakthroughs that may be made one day. I am talking about applications from the science that we already know, the fruits of discoveries already made. Advances in molecular, molecular level science and our growing understanding of the once forbidding world of quantum mechanics furnishes ample justification for this claim, not only in biology, but in nanoscale science. Virtually all the molecular rungs on the chemical ladders of the human genome have been identified, so we've got a, a almost complete parts list for a human being and some animals, and now science is trying to learn how to put all the parts together. There's another related revolution going on at and below the molecular level in computational and information science. This revolution also capitalizes on our growing penetration of the world of quantum mechanics. It is enabling unexpected, very rapid advances in computing, including quantum computing, which one day may endow a, lot, a laptop with the power of thousands of our biggest high-speed computers today. The age of computing has been with us only for about 30 years. The age of the hugely portentous age of quantum uh, computing may be upon us very quickly. So my take on nano is that it's not about the size. Uh, we're not trying to make a lot of really small stuff. Uh, we're trying to make precise stuff, as precise as it gets, the way nature does it. So the wet side is biological things. They work in water. The dry side is what chemists and physicists do. It's not water-based. It's either dry or maybe some other solvent. And he talked about the bio way of doing things and then the other way, like nanotubes and buckyballs and uh, nanoparticles. I find it informative to add a second dimension to this one-dimensional look at nano. And I add the dimension of active versus passive. So if we look at the wet side, the passive side is where all the action is in drugs today. That things work because of their charge and shape and their interactions with other things that have charge and shape. But when nature makes some uh, natural compound, when nature works, it actually is up in the active wet quadrant. Now, if you look at how a ribosome works, it's not just something that sits there and gloms onto something else. It, it moves. It, it transports things. It builds things with atomic precision. We have molecular motors that actively transport things around in our body. Uh, there's no way that our nervous system would work as well as it does if, if we had to rely on diffusion to get some neurotransmitters from the, uh, the, the uh, cell here to the, the very tip of the, the, the nerve. Uh, they're at, transported actively with molecular motors that carry things around. So when I look at the dry side of nano, what we're doing today is we take giant things of human scale, machinery and equipment. We try to make small, precise things. It's just a tremendous scale mismatch. So I, I think we ought to learn from nature. And if we're going to make small, precise things, we should make those with small, precise machinery, the way nature does it.